Australian Crops and Pasture Systems. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll welcome Jason to the stage. Thank you, and thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to tell you anything new, but I'm gonna go over a few things just to bring them back up in front of mind, uh, because my observation is that uh, sometimes we forget the simple things, and, uh, and that has implications. So when it comes to pasture establishment, as a soils person, I can accept that it's a pretty expensive thing to do. It's important and has long-term consequences if we don't quite get it right. And so, uh, you know, forgive my bias, it all starts with soil, so we need to make sure we've, we've, we've got that under control. So we all know the steps and rules of, of, um, of optimising soil fertility for pasture establishment. It starts with soil sampling. We then compare what the analysis comes back with to a critical value or a target that, that uh, either we have, uh, through our experience, determined or it's been advised to us or we get from the literature. And then we, we make uh, interventions based on that. So we fertilise or we ameliorate if necessary. So none of that's new. The rules of sampling, number one is take a representative sample. And of course, everyone has an idea of what that's in your head and you're sitting there thinking, Jason, yeah, we know that. Uh, but again, the observations are that that's not always done very well. So I haven't focused on from where here, uh, but just putting out there that you have a range of information at your fingertips already in terms of satellite imagery that's free. You have NDVI um, uh, images which are free and depending on what system you use, either easier to get or a bit more complicated to get. Um, but the biggest asset you have is farmer, farmer knowledge. Uh, every farmer can take you to a paddock and you can ask them where are the good bits and bad bits and they'll, they'll explain it to you and some of those bits will be different in dry years, wet years, um, you know, wet springs, dry springs. And so all that information is just layers of information that you can build to understand where differences exist. And those differences then become zones and those zones you then sample to, to ultimately um, manage. So I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going even simpler than that here today. Um, so to give you an idea of, of why representative sampling is important, I'm going to just take you through a, a piece of work that was done literally hundreds of metres from here. So just soil pH data, not to 10 because it was back in the day, uh, 50 randomly allocated sites from an area that was uniform. So it behaved uniformly. It was a pasture that was used for paddock. It, it was fertilised well, uh, had a history of lime in it. So 50 sites sampled, analysed. So there's a data set. So we have sites that are numbered and we have soil pHs that, uh, that relate to those sites. So the mean, the true mean of those, all those 50 sites is a pH in calcium chloride of, of about five. And there's a standard error. There's a, there's a mean and there's an error around, around that, da that data point. So if you were to make a graph that had um, soil pH and calcium chloride on our y-axis, the mean can be represented like that. And then there's a range of standard error above and below that line. And so what it really means is that anywhere in between that browny sort of pinky coloured band, we know that the, the, the actual mean sits within that. So we've got a measured mean, which is about five, but we've got this error, okay? So even our measured mean has an error around it. So that the true, absolute certain mean fits within that band somewhere. Now, what I want to talk to you about, number of cores. So uh, sampling's hard, right, sometimes. Life's hard, get over it, right? Sampling's a component of that. You've got to do it well. Cutting the number of cores that you take hurts you. So let's just say, um, well, when I teach this stuff, say between 20 and 25, sorry, 25 and 30 cores is what you should take. When you do that, when you take 25 cores and you do that three times with that, those 
data points. So of those 50 sites, if you randomly selected 25 cores, i.e. you went out and actually just did 25 cores, then that's each one of those. I've got three sets of data cores on the, on the x-axis there. So each one of these black dots is the mean of 25 cores, and then you have a standard error around those 25 core, cores that were done. And so this replicates what good practice would be. I've gone out into a uniform uh, area or an area that uh, zone that I think is uniform. I've taken 25 cores within that zone and I've got a mean. So you can see here that when you take that approach and if you did it three times, if you sample that paddock three times using that, that, that process, each time with 25 cores, you're pretty much within that band of the true mean. And I'm standing here looking at it and thinking, you see the third one, it's slightly below it, but it's not far off it. And within the error bars of each of those 25, it hits into that, that band of true meanness, if that's even a word, right? So what this is showing you, 25 cores, gets you a number that's usable and believable and robust and repeatable. Agreed? Right. So what I've observed is some people are cutting, cutting corners. Um, and so there are people are using eight cores. And, uh, and this is eight cores for a zone or eight cores for a paddock. And so when you do that, so the same process here, but I've taken eight cores and got a mean and an error. And they've done it again, so that's number two. I've done it again, that's number three. Number four, number five, I've done it nine times. I did it nine times because that number of cores it took to get nine was exactly the same as you saw in that last picture. Okay, so I've done the same amount of work, if you like. But you can see here the variability that you get around the mean of those eight cores. And so for, for all those nine samples, there's five where the means are outside the band that you can consider to be the real mean. So you've got to ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky, punk? You know, like, do you, if you're that, if you just happen to luck it and you, your one set of eight cores that you took for that zone was sample number three or data set number three here, you're way off, literally way off what the true mean is. That's like, what's that? That's like 4.75 pH. That's a liming intervention you've just pulled the trigger on, where the true mean's at five, and I'd argue you're probably still liming anyway, but, but you know, the alternatively, if you look at number six, at, at 5.25 pH is okay. I wouldn't expect to have a problem. You're gonna base decisions off the number that you get from your test. And that number's gonna have long-term implications when it comes to establishing a pasture. So, so do it right. So decreasing the number of cores gets you more error. Just note that. So have a look at the error bars and then compare the error bars there. See how this is so much more? You've got a lot more error. So you can be lucky, but you've got a lot of error as well. Okay, so that's why we always say, coming back to it, take 25 to 30 cores. If you're going to go to the effort of having someone come and take cores or do it yourself, get that bit done right. There's all these little components, and when you, when you skimp on it, it just undermines the integrity of what you've done. The next part would be sample to actually understand what you are managing. And so, um, soil depth is, a, is an issue. I've spoken about it many times before, but I'm going to do it again so, uh, because it's important. So soil depth here, 20 centimetres to, 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 to 20 centimetres on the y-axis, soil pH on the x-axis. If you do 0 to 10 sampling, which was what people uh, have a tendency to do, it just averages whatever's happening in that, in that, within that 0 to 10 centimetre region. So pH isn't, isn't uniform, and when you take a 0 to 10 core, you effectively average what you've got. So in this graph, we're saying that pH is 5.2. B 
But if you sampled in smaller intervals, and we've done the work to show that five centimetres is the optimal depth to get meaningful results, um, you can see that that 5.2 is actually created by being an average of extremes. And so often in pH, the 0 to 5 is much higher than the next layer because organic matter gets returned on the surface and organic matter itself is alkali, so the pH is higher. Uh, and then so the 5 to 10 is often much lower. And so that's real data. What you're looking at is real data. But the average of those two points is 5.2. But if I told you you had a pH 5.2 and you, you had experience dealing with soils, you'd go, oh yeah, that's not too bad. But if I said, actually, you've got a pH in there that's, you know, 5.5, sorry, 4.5, then you, a red light would start flashing in your head that I've got a problem. Okay, but it's the same soil, you just sampled it differently. So you're, you're, you're worried about acidity, especially in establishing uh, legume-based pastures, this is the sort of stuff that you need to know. You need to know if that five to 10 is acidic. It's gonna have big implications on how well that, that plant uh, establishes, emerges, grows roots, and then fixes nitrogen. So here's another soil, same thing, slightly different, a little bit more alkaline at the top, a little bit more acid in the five to 10, same average. So there's many ways to get the same average. This one's got an average of 5.2 as well, but it's more uniform. So the only way you're going to know is by doing those five centimetre samplings. So it gives you the real story, indication of the real story. If you do that to a depth of 20 centimetres, you get to see the trend of change with depth. And that's important because it determines what intervention you'll do and what to expect from it. So you can see that blue line, things are getting better with depth. And so really, you've only got a nasty acid layer around that 10 centimetre mark. That's the bit that you have to fix. And so, you know, you put your hand up. It's, if this is a soil surface, then it's here. That's within your reach. You can do stuff about that. Whereas if it's the red line, it's continuing, continued to be acid further down. That's a longer term intervention that you need to start working on. And so having this sort of information, allows you to work out a plan. You know, do you broadcast lime and incorporate when you, when you sow it in, when you're sowing that pasture? Uh, do you incorporate it, mix it in, and just, just flagging that uh, cultivation does not equal incorporation? Ripping something is not mixing. Mixing is what you want when you want to mix lime in. Uh, or do you need to deep incorporate? Like that, that blue line, if you were going to put lime in to get rid of the acidity, you'd want to mix it to the, you know, down to probably 12 centimetres or so if you want to fix the problem today. But if you've got time, you could, you could raise the pH in the 5 to 10, get the pH over 5.5 and, and allow more lime to move down and fix your problem in the next couple of years. You don't know what you're dealing with unless you measure it. Sample for it and measure it. By the way, other stuff are stratified as well. It's not just pH. Cowall P is stratified. So here, um, and like, I've just picked one graph because I you know, just didn't want to have a heap of graphs that show the same thing. You can see it's stratified. It's much more Cowall P at the surface, and then it de depletes with depth. That's really, really, really standard. So I can show you the same graph. Sometimes it's the, the, the curve is more extreme, and it moves left or right, just depending on the history of the paddocks, but it's, it's stratified as well. And just think about that in terms of, especially in, in, in mixed farming, where you plant seeds, where you put seeds, where, what that matters. And knowing that a lot of our rules that we use, our critical values, are based on naught to tens from days when people scarified paddocks three times before they sowed, which no one does anymore, and rightly so. Organic carbon stratified. CEC stratified. So within the 0 to 10, CEC is really, really stratified. One of the things that we use when we're making the liming recommendations, uh, CEC is going to have implications for calcium, magnesium, potassium retention, all stuff that's important to you, or should be. So that's why we're recommending these five centimetre sampling um, layers. 
Not saying that you have to do it all the time, but um, certainly if you're going into a pastor establishment phase, the extra information you get from it um, rewards the effort for, for getting it done. So what are the targets you aim for? Soil pH, phosphorus, sulphur are key. Um, we've got these targets from our research, keep the pH, aim for it around to be uh, 5.8 if you want alkali to move down into more acid layers. Phosphorus depends on PBI, so if we, from the literature, we've got Colwell P to hit 95% relative yield on our y-axis, and we've got PBI on the x, and there's a nice relationship for Australian pastures that looks like that. And so what that means for around our area, about 30-ish is a good, good target to aim for. Some people would say higher, cool, and with it. And sulphur, from the literature again, about eight parts per million or milligrams per kilogram is our target. So how are we doing with that? And this is information that um, I've got from Dave Harvison. So 355 soil tests, pastures mainly, but there are some grazing paddocks in there, 0 to 10, just looking at how, how far off these targets are we. So here's pH. The red line's what we're saying. We want to be over that. We want to be over 5.5 for, for, to allow alkali to move down. And you can see there's an awful lot of data points below that. Even if you drop that line, red line one bar on the, on the y-axis to five, there's still an awful lot of data points below that. Coldwell P, here it is at 30. There's some over, awful lot below. Sulphur, a lot below. So maybe we've dropped the bar a little bit on sulphur. Sulphur's a bit tricky, it does move, but that's what the data shows. So as a summary, of all those paddocks, 355 paddocks, 12% were above the red line, 37% were above the red line when it came to Colwell P, but only 11 were above both P and S, and only below 4% we're above the red line for all those th three things. Okay, so when establishing pastures, it warrants proper sampling. Okay, it's a time to actually invest in your, in your uh, data. Um, don't skimp on the number of cores. Don't cut corners soil sampling. Do that bit right. You're going to make a heap of decisions. Um, some, of them, some of the consequences are going to be out of your control. When it comes to soils, this stuff you can do. Get it done right. Five centimetre intervals gets you good data that's useful in your management, enables you to come up with good plans forward, defines where the stratification is in coal P, CEC, organic carbon, as well as pH, enables you to make better decisions. You've got to monitor your soils to be sure your management's doing what you think. There are a lot of data points on those graphs that were below where we need to be, and people were surprised that that was the case. So the only way you'll know is by measuring and monitoring correctly. So thanks, everyone, and thanks to the cast of thousands that we work with. Um, my understanding and knowledge of soils is built on interacting with people, and so I thank all those people for that. Great. Thanks, Jason. You don't take that. And again, Jason will be back up after lunch in our uh, Q&A session.